are now tuned in to the Free Play Media Podcast Network. Thanks for joining us. If you're watching on Facebook, we are live. Chris Denman, Travis Terrell, very special guest today that I'll tell you about in just a second. I'm going to pay some bills real quick. Get online. Go to BarrelBeardAndTattoo.com. Great sponsor of ours. Barrel Beard and Tattoo Oil. Great for your skin. Great for your hair. Also, Neovitin.com. That's right. We have a multivitamin sponsor. And more importantly, we're joined in studio at Gaslight for the great Rachel Feinstein. Good morning, Rachel. Thank you. It's Rachel Feinstein. How dare you? I say Steen because I like to accentuate the, <laughs> the, I guess, the nature of where it comes from. Other stations in town don't care for your types, I've been told. No, no. We got one piece of press was canceled this morning, and I quote, because they said they don't care for Jews. Mm. <laughs> Never mm. cared for Jews. Damn you, PBS. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why your publicist set you up with all those alt-right uh, <laughs> podcasts, but uh, yeah, so We'd good to have you back. To have her, but... but yeah, um, well, you know, Know, the whole Jew thing, right? Yes, we just couldn't quite. They didn't want another snout in the studio. That's what they called me, a snout. And I am not a snout. I'm more than a snout. It's a new term. I'm a woman. Good for you. Uh, you've been, you came in from New York. You had a big New Year's in New Orleans with the great Ani DeFranco. Would not have expected that with yourself and Amy Schumer doing comedy. You bring in Ani DeFranco. Yes, that was Amy's favorite from high school. So her and her sister, her sister came out. And they watched together by the stage, and it was very adorable. I love that. Big Ani DeFranco high school fan. And Ani DeFranco was really was really lovely and sweet. And Hannibal Burris was on the show, and, and Al Jackson, and Vanessa Bear. And oh, wow. Yeah, it was great. Did you bring them to St. Louis? Good fun after. And that- Jennifer Coolidge threw this crazy party at this house she has in uh, New Orleans, and it's this beautiful old house. They they perform. I mean, they uh, taped some of, I think, American Horror Story or something like oh, that. Oh, dope. There. I think it was eight. I think that's what it was, yeah. Exciting. So you've been busy this morning. You're at Funny Bone this weekend. So if you guys are around, I highly recommend it. Last time Rachel was in town, like a year and a half ago, something around mm-hmm. that, I went and saw like a set and a half of yours. Great crowds and uh, a really enjoyable experience. So not only stand-up, very funny. We've been seeing you. You're crashing regularly now. Obviously, you've had a bunch of movie parts. I feel like there's a nice swell Behind you in your career right so. now. Yeah, you worked so hard for a while now. I just want to make it in show business. <laughs> That's all I've ever wanted. Have you noticed uh, an uptick at the live shows from crashing or any of your other projects? It's I mean, hard to know why people are there. Right. You know? Yeah. Because you have people no confidence. People have no idea yourself. who I am. Right. For sure. <laughs> One guy just like literally fell asleep slowly in the middle of my show. I was in Vegas and I just watched him. He really he came in and, and gifted himself with a nice sweet nap. Mm, I just mm. watched Watched his head kind of sway a little and then yeah. finally fall. Did you change your material up at all to try to snap him back it, into it? It hurt. Or? It hurt like hell. Nothing was going to get him. He wasn't interested. I called. <laughs> I called on him a couple times to wake up, and he he was kind of like. Uh, Ah, enough. Like, he didn't care for me. <laughs> like, like, you bothered him. He scolded yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. He was like, all right. <laughs> Stop I, whining. I don't usually yell at guests, but that's really fucking rude for you to bring up Travis's Vegas trip on our show now. I mean, he was a little disrespectful to you Speaking at your of show. Speaking hookers, Travis. Yeah. We did. Travis, you were in charge of the blow and hookers. That did not happen today for Rachel. Would you like to apologize? I don't, I'm a Christian boy, man. I don't, I don't mess with that shit anymore. <laughs> you were just talking about this. You and Beth are one of our favorites. We're driving around, rocking out to your playlist. Let's get into this a little bit. Uh, hip-hop on the playlist in the car. What are you going yes, with? I've got, I've got some good 90s hip-hop. Uh, I have some from... Uh, from Three Feet High and Rising, I love that album, and um, The Low End Theory. But the stuff we listened to was like Credence and uh, Johnny Cash. Love Johnny Cash. Sure. John Prine. Look um, at you. Yeah, I like That's the a deep old cut. stuff. But what's yeah. the mood? What, what, like, I feel like those are different We were falling moods. in love. That was the oh, Beth and, I, Beth and you... I are in love. This is quite different. <laughs> On our morning show, we did, we did half a... Me. 
<laughs> she has. She's like, yeah, cute. <laughs> on the morning show this morning, we did half an hour on Yacht Rock, which uh-huh. is the exact opposite of your actual quality playlist too. So thank you. We're trying to figure this out. Do you feel a Yacht Rock party in February is appropriate in St. Louis, Missouri? We're trying to put this together. Is there a such thing as appropriate in St. Louis? Nice. I'd say Generally this town not. Is off the chain. Like my shows at the St. Louis funny though. <laughs> Everyone. She cut um, her mic. I'm alone in life. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, uh, how are you still? Are you uh, are you single? Are you dating? What's what's going on? <laughs> have a boyfriend. Yeah, I was going to gonna say. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a certain way, we're all alone. In life. I just wake up at three in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Travis is going to walk out of the yeah. studio now. Yeah, he's, just because he's you know a, that kind of that sting you get from alcohol that wakes you up suddenly. You yes. Know? And I just scream, "I'm alone in life." <laughs> Come have wings with me at the St. Louis Funny Bones. <laughs> Let's turn the uh, lights. But yes, 10 I do. I that. have a boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And he's. We made the playlist together. Yeah, I called it. He's a fireman, so I called it playlist behind the fire. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I like to joke that he has like a TV show called Behind the Fire. Like, I'm Pete. I'll take you behind the fire. Come along. Is but he's fi- just not wearing pants or underwear, but he has like the top half of a fire. Right. Man. Is this a true TV pickup, a National Geographic? What, just, what station do we take it to? I just narrate this when we're like laying around in bed. I'm like, hey, I'm Captain Pete. I'm going to take you behind the fire. <laughs> some have some fire-based questions. No, firefighters I'm are not- matter-of-fact guys. How, do, how, how does that work? Like, uh, because, I mean, I would imagine some have sense of humors, but I'm he's sure like you- a, He's a playful person. It's harder for him to be serious than- than joke. They're all like they're kind of like comics. They're a bunch of idiots. Like <laughs> they all live in the same they have house substance together. Substance abuse issues. Like what? Do you- <laughs> I mean, they all like they're like their lives are ridiculous, like ours. Except they also save people's lives. Right. And they're heroes or whatever, whatever. But yeah. um, <laughs> does he throw you know, that in your they face? They do something like, heroic and real. But they also like you know are like kids. Like like they live in this house together for a couple of days a week and you know talk smack and say like filthy, despicable things to, to each other the way comics do. Right, you know, absolutely. They're kind of like us in certain ways. And you know how like when a non-comic walks up to the table, we'll be like, oh, there's a civilian coming out. You know, that's right. kind of how it is at the right. firehouse, you know? Right. Like a I'm regular to... person. <laughs> does he like, so does he throw his career in your face like, hey, I saved a meth head teenager at a burning fire today. I see you made a couple kids. When we first started dating, he would like text me each time he had a call. Like he would text me almost with the same like jargon as if he was calling it on the radio. <laughs> so he'd be like, Pri- "I got a private dwelling," you know, and he'd be like, or he would just say the name of the fire. Like he'd be like, "I got a 1075 private dwelling fire on all floors, fire throughout." I'm like, "I don't know what you want me to do with this information." <laughs> yeah, I'm just laying in my stomach in Toledo having macaroni and cheese right now. But, um, <laughs> a little peek behind the curtain for the glamorous lifestyle of a TV movie and uh, comedy star, Rachel Feinstein. Yeah, but yeah, he would like he would call in the fire as if that yeah he was calling him in on the radio and then um but no they all joke around they're ridiculous but i try to get him to talk about something serious right. and that's harder for him like if i want to talk about like an emotional thing i'd be like we're having feelings corner on the bed and i'd be like <laughs> oh no feelings corner <laughs> you know i'll go into a burning building but he's like he's terrified right. of feelings corner turning up the heat emotionally like, i want to discuss something feelings corner he's like oh babe come on no feelings corner please <laughs> I mean, I had talked about, and sorry to pivot away from fire talk, but we we chatted just briefly about crashing. I know Greg Fitzsimmons writes for that. I respect the hell out of him. Love Greg Fitzsimmons. Obviously, he's Joe, so funny, isn't he? Yeah, he's great too. Uh, so he works on that show. If you just watch the show, first off, it's on HBO, so immediately people are going to be okay. I trust that, mm-hmm. right? Judd Apatow is part of it. Mm-hmm. You have uh, Pete Holmes headlining, but every single time you turn that that show on, you can see. I don't know, 10, 15 comics that are out touring all the time. I guess as far as uh, having done so much that you have, what's the experience been like diving in on this? Is your role going to expand on the show? I mean, do you want it to? What's it, uh, what's it mean to you, I guess, career-wise? Um, I don't know if it's going to expand or what that – I mean, I don't know what their, their plans are for me, but um, I play myself. I knew – I got to know Apatow – when I was doing, I did a scene in Trainwreck and I did Punch Up on Trainwreck. So I was sort of on set for that summer and, right. and Apatow was doing spots at the Comedy Cellar. So we were all kind of hanging out. So that's how I got to know him. And then and then somebody called me to audition for 
Crash, my agent called me to uh, to do an audition for Crashing, and I didn't want to go at first because I was like working on a pilot, and I felt like I was going to go in and not be good enough. And I was like, I, Apatow has a positive memory. I just want to leave it at that. And, <laughs> right. you know, That's terrible. You're so talented. That, yeah, you know? I hate but that. it's such a bad instinct. But I was like, no, I just want to leave things without actively embarrassing myself in front of anyone. But um, they were like, no, 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 just go, just go. And so Artie was in my audition. And, nice. and and Big J Okerson, yeah. who I know really well. So I know those guys. And when I went in, they just kind of had us improvise. Right. So I was like, oh, thank God I went. Because if, if I can improvise, if I can just do it myself, I'll be okay. If I have to stick to the lines, a lot of auditions, I'm, I'm terrible. And I feel like I've left not just being awful, but like I've left a mess in the room for right. them to clean up, you know? Like they <laughs> they seem like angry. wash the right. taste out yeah, of their yeah, mouth Yeah, they, they yeah. Seem, I soil the place, yeah. Mm. Mm. And then, but... With, but Artie was so sweet, and afterwards he like walked me to the elevator to talk about it. Artie's just like such a doll. Right. I love him so much. How's he so doing? He was so cool. He just he's sober right now. I think uh, I don't want to speak for how many days his sobriety, but I think it was like a little over a month. So that's good. Yeah. So it was really good to see him back at the cellar, and and um, yeah. Anyway, so that's how I ended up doing the show, and the part is I'm myself. So I'm right, Rachel. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to explore there. I hope they expand that because, again, super talented. And uh, I love seeing you be a part of it. I literally, like, every time I see you, you pop up and something, I'm like, here she goes. Here Aww, she goes. Like, you, you guys, you. it's such a fine line between, uh, you know, you have headliner status, which is a big deal in your world. You're touring all over the time, all over the place. You get to perform in front of so many people. And then the TV aspect comes in. And I just, I always wish that for good people that come through, just like, please let this work where you can just be comfortable to make creative choices and yeah. do things that you love. And you're still going to get out and tear it up on the road too. That's all I want yeah. in this year life. <laughs> Is You've it, just explained it all for me. Well, I, I'm very good at that. I like Thank to mansplain you. everything to our, uh, <laughs> to our super talented guests. Well, you're in, like when you're in, in a writer's room, like when you're working on train wreck or of course, with crashing, or even like you did when you did your show for New Year's Eve in New Orleans, when you're around so many talented people, is it like a game of double dutch as far as when you guys are interacting or when you're trying to come up with future material? How does that work? Do you guys bounce things off each other? Do you guys, or you've been around each other for so long, you know each other on a personal level, you just you're more comfortable being each other. You're not really for my stand up. Um, a lot of I, I, usually a lot of it starts out with a story, something that happens to me. I'm more okay. of a storyteller, so I'll tell it to my my close friends who are all comics, and you know Schumer and Nikki Glazer, who's right. from St. Louis. So I tell it, or Marina Franklin or Bridget Everett. So it's I I talk to other comics and um say something that I'm thinking like vent about a story. Usually some weird humiliating thing that happened to me, and they're like, you should say that on stage, or you should try that on stage, cause right? I'm, as a stand-up, like you take all the awful things that happen to you and they become material. So it's like this bin you can place all your heinous, strange, jarring experiences. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so sometimes you initially just vent to your friends who are comics are like, do it on stage. And I'm like, yeah, it is fine. I guess you're right. It's funny. You is know? it a fine line for them to be objective and also a friend? I would imagine at least early on, there probably was a moment where I, as a friend, I want to be nice at the same time. I know in order for you to become better, maybe they had some no people. No, we weird? say stuff to each other. Like, Just, yeah, okay. it's very helpful. They'll be like, no, no, because the audience will cringe if you say that. Say it like this, or yeah, really? we help That's each other awesome. out. Yeah. That's really cool feedback. Yeah. Cause usually it doesn't start like, hey, is this funny? It starts like you're just telling them something and they're like, wait, you should say that on stage. And then they're kind of, oh, nice. but how would I explain it? Like, and they help you kind of frame it or whatever, you know? So we're pretty honest. I think with each other and it's, it's helpful. Yeah. So that's how you, m most stuff starts. And then, and in writer's rooms, I, I haven't been a writer on that many shows, like for my own, like pilots and right. things like that. But I get, I get like more shy in those situations. If I, if they're my friends and I know them, then I'll bring up ideas, but I'm always like, it always feels like school right. and I was a terrible student. So I'm always like, I don't know, I can't do that. So that, as far as element, as far as what you feel more comfortable in, you would prefer working on your own material as far as, cause I know you say you mentioned you working on your pilot, being in a writer's That's room. That's different with it because it's my pilot. Right. So it's okay. like, I, I'm just hanging out with my friends and, you know, and I, f I still always though feel like I'm, you know, playing pretend and yeah, right. I'm not a real adult. <laughs> it, and, I love that too, because you're a very smart person, that, but you can also take that peek from where you're sitting too, where you're like, yeah, I get to do this for a living and it's, it, you get to take these chances, but it could mean so many different things for you career-wise, lifestyle-wise with all these opportunities that present themselves. Like that's a, that's an interesting place to be. Yeah, it's it's scary. <laughs> Does it ever scared. get competitive though? <laughs> I, I, I always feel like I, I'm a competitive person myself, but I always feel like uh, no, she gets wins though. 
That's the difference. That is very yeah, true. She does but that. as far as like, when, do you, is, is there ever a moment? And I'm obviously, I'm sure you're excited for your friend's success. But is there ever a moment do you measure where you are to anyone else in your circle? Or I, mean, you I try think everybody not does to? that to some extent. But then the thing is, you have moments of maybe feeling, you know, like uh, envious of this or that thing that somebody did. But at the end, uh, like at the end of the day, which is how I start most of my sentences, but. Uh, <laughs> Your friends are all helping each other. Right, So right. all the work I get is from my friends. So you can't really stay jealous of anything for very right. long because everything I get is is from my friends. That's so. That, that's so true, too, where it's just like, well, these are all a bunch of people who've worked hard and struggled together. So, of course, there's going to be opportunities that open up whenever you sell a pilot or something gets green. Absolutely you're gonna, everything yeah. I've ever done. is just comics putting me in things. So th- it's like, yeah, it, it's funny because there's this rep- reputation with stand-up that it's so, like, cutthroat. Right. Like, but it's actually, like... There are teams I've, I've noticed. Sure, but people, that's do, life people do. People do. I mean, people are no more fucked up than any other walk of right. life. And actually, comics <laughs> right. are like they've gotten me everything I've ever had. So, wow. and and if anything ever happens to a comic, nobody raises money faster than comics for each other. The comics that have no health insurance or right. no anything are always the first person to give you a hundred bucks if somebody's in trouble without asking many questions. Right. You know, if anything happens to a comic, so it really is this. You know, weird deranged family. You know, <laughs> it is. I'm that's just, what, that's one like, of my favorite things. Like you literally lived in an apartment with Sherrod Small. I did. Like that's <laughs> like how funny is that apartment? And he like, would that, hook up with girls, and they'd have to walk through my room to get to the bathroom. So I'd have these awkward conversations <laughs> with these girls pulling their t-shirts down, and yeah, I felt so bad Pull for them. <laughs> yeah, or you're oh. like, hey, will you not touch my stuff, uh, ma'am? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was more like, don't touch Sherrod. I was like, I could vouch for him as a friend, but you are making a grave mistake right now. Uh, so we talked to plenty of people. Uh, for example, with all the stuff that has happened recently, just things coming to light, Weinstein in particular, mm-hmm. our pal Adam Carolla literally was like, saw this coming for 20 years. Up next is another director. Has anything, I guess, surprised you? And we don't have to go super deep on this entire topic, but has anything surprised you, I guess, with whether it's the the lights being shown, the I guess the public getting behind certain movements? I don't even want to classify it as one movement. It's just it's in the air and it's out there and it seems to be pushing a certain way. Mm-hmm. You're literally in the mix of it. You've been in the mix of everything for a little while. I guess, how do you feel about the current climate of uh, whether it's the Me Too movement or just certain people getting outed? Uh, and I think there's been different levels of people getting outed, but I guess being right in the mix of everything, what's that like to I I mean, guess, experience su- it from that? I'm not entirely surprised, of course, um, the Harvey Weinstein thing. I mean, this guy is just wildly raping and abusing. And that was, mm-hmm. I didn't know about that. That was insane that that was going I on think for people, so many years. It tips people just, off when people are just horrible people. And they're like, well, maybe that's like, that's what seems to be a, a common thread where like, that guy was a jerk for so many years. Like, yeah, and obviously just like a really dangerous sociopath that right. to me should just be in jail for the rest right. of his life. But uh, there's jail's, a lot if of jails, even the rest. I know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's like terrifying. But I, I do hope that the more stories that come out, and then the safer people get to feel, you know, and each generation is like a little safer than the last. And right. uh, I know. I mean, of course, when I started stand up, I mean, it was our. It's already ten times better than you know than when I started. It used right. to be if you were like a girl on a show, people would say to you. Oh, we already had a lady on the show, like you know, and and it, they considered it redundant. Right. They didn't even mm-hmm. realize like what they were saying to you. It was just right. like, oh, right. we can't have. We already had a lady. We can't have badge badge. It was <laughs> yeah. just like this very simple thing that nobody apologized for. It was right. just considered to have two females. Just they just assume you. I guess you would speak about the exact same things. And I didn't question it myself. Like, oh, you had a girl on. Okay, cool. You know. Right. And these ways that you even think yourself that you don't question, and then just the nonsense that you deal with on the road, and you know, just the literal danger, active danger right. that you're in as like a female comic when you're starting, when you're staying in like terrifying places and they'll send, you know, I was saying before, like any sex offender to go pick you up at the airport. And right. yeah, I mean, so I do, but I do think it's getting better and the more people discuss things that happen to them and share stories that happen to them, the, the, the safer it'll be. And I, I worry more about, I mean, you, yeah, you want it to be better for, for each group of, of people. And like, it's, it's alarming 
you know, what... Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, <laughs> from a, absolutely. From a, from a comedic standpoint, though, uh, with the beauty a lot of times with comedians is being able to take the uncomfortable and obviously make it funny. But in this instance, especially when you have, say, in this case, a, a guy like Louis C.K., a guy that has been so respected in the industry, is it easy for, I guess, what are the challenges for comedians... When one, it's someone that is part of your industry to take that topic and then maybe try to make a routine or material around. Like, is there a way you can take what's going on, what we've what we've heard, and make it funny? We've seen Chappelle try. We saw Seth Meyers do it recently at the Golden Globes. Is it is it challenging, especially when you're so close to it when you're trying to? I mean, it's hard. I take things that for, are from my own life, my right. own personal experiences, less than other people's uh, abuse. <laughs> but right, right. I try to draw more from my own personal experiences. It's all. It's all always hard sometimes when you know some of these people, right. that, and you, you know, it's just your learn. It's it's hard. It's all like it's a weird, strange time, and I've and I've been treated well by right. some of these guys, and not had those experiences, and then you learn somebody else did, and you have to confront that in yourself. Like, all right, that's something else, you know. Right. So it's and and but I, I hope that that like everybody from the more people talk about it, people can learn, and I don't think it's all black and white. Uh, right. You know, I think that 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 hopefully the more people discuss things, the more people can learn to better their behavior and and all that. I said something like on one of these podcasts, I was like, you can't fry them all in the same pan right. and they all trash me for a good half hour. Because really? <laughs> I was like, that's not even an expression. Like, you can't you fry just, them all. Like, I just can't help like, oh, with this. You can't stinks, get angry. You know? <laughs> but sometimes you know other sides to people and you hear things and it's just like, and you just, it's, it's weird. I'm processing it along with everybody else and, you know, um, I mean, obviously, it's 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 crazy. It's 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 a really ludicrous time. But I think that the more people talk about it, everything that they're going through, then the better, the like the safer the environment's going to be for the next group of anybody that has a right. daughter now is going to grow up a little safer with less rancid things happening right. to her. Right. You know. <laughs> as a comedian, do you do you do you feel like everything's on the table as far as to to joke about? Like, I, and I know there's a fine line on certain things, and frankly, at the end of the day, it comes down whether or not you're funny or not. But do you think mm-hmm. as, there's when people say as a comedians everything's on the table? Do, are you do you believe that? Yeah, I mean, I think if it's funny, it's funny, and right. I don't think people should be. Uh, it's it's tricky. It, it, yes, there's so, certain things people say that you're just like, ugh, that was just right, kind of right. wrong. But how can you police it until you kind right. of hear it and know how it feels? So I guess I feel both ways. I feel like you should, you know, you don't want to start heavily policing what everybody says and right. and declaring one person as sexist or racist based on one thing that they said. Right. Um, which is easy to happen in this day. It and happens age all the time. I'm scared time. of it all the time. I'm scared uh, of things that I used to talk about that I realize now I've grown and, and see things in a different way being held up in front of me. Right. Just like it, because as a comic, it's like all the stages of clumsy, dumb it's growth evolution, that you right. had. Is, you're trying yeah. to work it, work everything out, and then you're taking a feeling or a thought that you've had, and it's uh, well, and it's portrayed this way. And that again, you're right. Age has so much to do with it. And now everything yeah. is on ta- on video, on whatever app you're using, whatever else. It's going to feel different. There are things that we're going to talk about here today that if we watch it in five years, we'll be like, "Oh, that was rough." Like, what do we? You know, it's yeah. That's and just if you took the text mis- exchanges, like of even mm. me and me and my group of friends, I think yeah. I would never be allowed to work again. The disgraceful, <laughs> insane things that we say to each other, but it's tricky because, like, sometimes it's because you have experienced this. It's your way of joking about it, you know, yeah. whether it be like you know, sexism or racism or some sexual trauma or whatever it is. That's how people joke. That's how my aunts and my grandma would joke about the Holocaust because it's like it, anything that's painful. Right. You know, Joan Rivers had some quote that I'll mangle, but it was just like, you know, life goes by fast, relax, it's all funny, you know? And I do I do believe that. I understand mm. that sometimes people say things that you really want to stop and ask them about, like, you know, and I don't think that you can say anything Always, I'm. Sh- I mean, if I s- there's moments where people say things that I'm upset by, but I hope there can be a conversation, and we don't just decide that one person says something and then they're they're just not allowed to exist with the rest of right. us because nobody important. can grow or learn like <laughs> right. that, you know? Yeah, I mean, you end up with just people dictating that, and at the end of the day, still, at the end of the day, 
you have people running things at the top, and we're always going to make make errors and have yeah. And you want people stuff. to be able to have a like a conscious conversation because it can't just be like you're bad, go away forever. I mean, that's like that's childish to me, and it's not it just nobody's going to grow or learn anything or learn to be more like thoughtful or sensitive if that's how we do things. Certainly. That to me is is uh, yeah, just it's it's just kind of disastrous. Very true. When it comes to your your pilot, can you give us any ideas to? what it's about or the direction you're going with a, it. Are you currently working on one that's like in traction? I mean, what do yeah, you... Yeah, I have a scripted pilot, which is about my personal life and my life as a comic and <laughs> also, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my family and all that. And then I have another pilot that's um, producing with uh, Amy and uh, me and Amy's uh, sister, Kim Caramelli, who's a really funny writer and comic, also wrote on um, Amy's show, Comic Comedy Writer. I mean, um, not stand-up. So we're producing something and it's like my stand up kind of deconstructed through these little oh, nice. you know sketches and man in the street kind of stuff and 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 um Where do you take that? Camera. I mean is it like I feel like Comedy Central's gotten even better but you have mm, 10 other options, 20 other options now. I do feel you, like there, I feel like there's more options. Yeah, where like to, Where would you want it to go? I where guess. do you want it to, where do you want this to live? I don't know. I mean, I'm just happy that anybody else. <laughs> yeah. I can't dictate that. Asking. I'm at the point in my life where, yeah. Like here, right. Netflix, take right. it. Yeah. Here's how I feel. When I would leave somebody's house when I was a kid, my mom would stand and stare at me, glare at me on the doorstep until I went around to each person in the house and said, thank you for having me. You know? <laughs> I love your mom. That's and fantastic. So I had to say that, and that's still how I feel. I'm like, I'm allowed. I can sit here. Yeah. You know? like, so I'm like, anybody that wants to... <laughs> Yeah, but I my friend actually her dad I just saw him recently like the one of my best friends growing up Lisa Kaplan and I saw her parents Mr. Kaplan he was like Mr. He Kaplan calls listens me, to the show Les Kaplan I know you're out there he always calls me thank you for having me because he says like he'd be in the middle of working in his office and he'd just see my dumb body standing in the doorway like thank you for having me Mr. Kaplan I'd be like all right sure whatever I noticed that when you walked in you literally made a point to politely say hello to everyone here you're like guy wiping down a glass like <laughs> dude setting up the camera all so that's yeah. why the Jewish and black community get along so well because you can't as a black person you can't Go into someone else's house and not say thank you for having me. Is there a it's worse? Big. Is yeah. there a worse you kid? Get your like ass that's kicked. That, I can't stand. Like, just walk in, like take a glass of something, eat something, and walk out. Whoa, no, 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 no. Yeah, not a thing. and when I called somebody on the phone, I don't know if you had this too, but I'd say, "Hi, this is Rachel. Um, may I please speak with?" Yo, yeah. no doubt. No, or I, I was in big trouble. Well, I, you, was, I went through a Travis phase says where, that you just have you have to be like the tough guy voice. Hello. Well, that's only in public, and oh, they're laughing okay, on the gotcha. softy. But no, I no, yeah, I I remember one time I went through a terrible phase when I would call my mother by her first name, and I remember. Well, I don't remember much. I swear, I got a concussion from my uncles and stepfather <laughs> and everybody from that. But yeah, you could not walk they into anyone else's it. house and just. Not say thank you. There should you be for more of that. Me. I think I we think need to so. spread that. I think that. politeness is really important. I feel like uh, this generation could use a little bit more. Like they're not at the center of everything. You know that kind of thing. Remember, <laughs> this generation is you know. in Tide Pod, so we're just one yeah. step at a time. Uh, any right Tide now. Pod material tonight at the Funny Bone in Westport? <laughs> <laughs> You guys just half That's set. a correct answer. Thanks, just laugh that off. Uh, what else is going up? So you get the pilot coming. People are going to go see you at Funny Bone all weekend long. What else do we need to know about? Have you made any other? Uh, the podca- Netflix special will be out in March. Nice. March. Half hour. That's awesome. Yeah, That's the, so great. It's a season. It's a show. A series. That's the word I'm looking for. On Netflix called the Stand Ups. So yeah. I'm doing a half hour special yeah, with that. What Nate Bargatze did one uh, with Nate Nikki so much. Glazer so and yeah, they. Uh, that's a fantastic. They like. That's such a good time for you to be doing what you're doing right now because they, I, they keep putting out great stuff. Nate is so hysterical, and I felt so bad because we were doing this special, I mean, this uh, festival, Bonnaroo. Nate, so. Uh, Little up and coming festival. Yeah. Very cute. So, Nate Borgazzi's in this, uh, the thing, and. Um, and I was excited to see him again. So I was like, let's have a beer. And he's like, no, I'm good. I'm like, come on, man. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he was like, no, I'm all right for now. you know. And then I, I just get a beer, open it. And I'm like, come on, Nate, we're having a beer, man. <laughs> and then so we did. And then I think he had like 12 more. And then he told me later that he had been sober. Oh, no. <laughs> for like a year before that. <laughs> And I still feel actively guilty about this. You should. kept being like, I'm fine. I'm like, Nate, uh, come on, man. You're not fine. You need a brew, bro. It's fine. I'm like, no. I didn't know he was sober. Yeah. That's 
You said Bonnaroo, by the way. Is that as far as playing anything else is in front of a crowd? Is that how is I working that crowd? Is that an active audience? I'm about to say, I'm curious, how do you, as a comedian, how do you break that wall, if you will? It seems like there'd be a ton of distractions in that it's environment. It's crazy. You're outside in a tent. It's not ideal to perform in tents. I prefer right. walls to tents. <laughs> Um, really Funny outside bone, things in walls. general, like wind isn't yes. funny. You don't want a <laughs> wind to disrupt right. your dumb sentence. An errant hawk <laughs> flying through. Like you don't you want a that row of people just ODing in front of you. I yeah. would imagine that would be very difficult to perform in front of. <laughs> that could be very strange. Everybody, I love those festivals though, because we get to hang hard. I'm going to keep disrupting you. Every I know. I we can sit here and talk for two hours, but just don't talk shit whenever you leave here. Like those guys wouldn't let me leave, right? <laughs> Ireland. We had so much fun in Ireland this summer. What happened in Christy Ireland? Christy Stefano and Colin Quinn and Sam. Oh Burrell. my God. Colin Quinn in Ireland. Do they Come treat on. him like a, like royalty there? That is. Oh that's, my yeah. God. Now that's that should be filmed. I was going to say next we time. just stro- throw a GoPro on that and just keep it on all of you for the next one. That's we had fantastic. so much fun. We went to some sort of like royal museum in Ireland, and Colin's like explaining things because he's like you know he's the, that guy. He's like yeah, the only adult in the room. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey, listen up. Listen we were up. like in some important, like royal dining room in this museum, and uh, Christy Stefano farted like so loudly. <laughs> it was so horrifying. Uh huh. Just like I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It was like in the middle of this museum, and this yeah, it was like a royal something of some dining room Smack. of some sort of historic yeah. significance. And he goes, "What? I have children. I'm like, what is that? What does How that is that ever a reason? Right. That means." In the middle of a, of a lecture that. of the potato famine. <laughs> like, what do you want? I got a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so that's funny. a... He'll say things that I'm just like, what are you... He was like, I think we, we were talking about something about could this house in the woods. He's like, no, nah, nah, I don't like nature. Like, Who doesn't? Uh, no, nah, I don't mess with nature. Okay. It's scary out there. Yeah. Never cared for nature. You got to film that one next time. God, I think I that's just, what you, man, I'm a uh, level of profound ignorance. You've got to respect. I love Chris because he just knows he's trash. <laughs> Nah, never cared for nature. <laughs> no nature. Oh. Nah, nah, nah. I don't buy all that nature stuff. <laughs> Not into it. We I'm had so much that, fun. I, I, I love that, and I love that about you. I've seen you in your element. You're very kind, very nice to people that come up. So you guys uh, can go say hello at Funny Bone this weekend. What's the, like, let's end on a funny note. What's uh, a crazy interaction you've had with a fan in the past year that didn't result in, like, fear? You have, have you had anything happen? I mean, because you run in these circles where it's like there's levels to, you know, like you said, being the public being aware of you. You're around Amy Schumer a lot. You're around people who are just literally people go nuts over when they see. Has anything ridiculous happened at a show outside um, of Alan I had a soft Franco taco point? thrown at me once. And then I you. talked about it on the radio. Mm-hmm. And it was like a soft taco kind of hit, through, kind of hit my like chest area and then just sort of fell down. Mm. It kind of smeared down. <laughs> sat, it was like a saddest fall. So Pay extra led for to that the, on porn. What led to it being thrown? Me. Was it just someone drunk? No, it was um, it was performing at a college at the Culinary Institute of Las Vegas. I'm not name dropping, but you know, I've made it. All right, I have made it, and I want to thank my family, and the Mox Brothers. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she thanked every it. chef on her way out. From the- <laughs> and I couldn't have done it without you, Daddy. But um, so anyway, this taco fell off me, and then I went on the. Uh, he was annoyed. It was a student sober. He was annoyed because I was performing in front of the microwave where, that he wanted to use to microwave his Shut taco, up. and so he threw it at me because I was merely an impediment. <laughs> what? I was less a show and more of an impediment to him microwaving his soft taco. So people were. His- and look, you're sitting here today, so screw you, soft and taco. Look at me guy. sitting here in this unfinished basement. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of rape rooms, look at me now. But anyway, um, so I I, uh, I was on um, the radio talking about getting the soft taco thrown at me. Right. And then a man came to my show no. with a taco, Mm-mm. kind of hands shaking. He's like, I've got something I heard your story. And it was, yeah, it was very unstable. I don't like Gallagher And then he handed me the taco and he's like, open it up. <laughs> And inside that taco, Go there on. was a little note that said, will you marry me? And today, I would like to say that we are a homiling <laughs> and So we beautiful. What a beautiful story. It's been the best 14 years. <laughs> um, at home, you'll see I'm holding it up. I'm worth it. 
You are worth it. Rachel, thanks for coming Thank by. You, it's so great so to have you back thanks, in guys. St. Louis. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you later.